Welcome, everyone, to the Change Starts Here podcast. I'm your host, Dustin Odom. And this week's episode is focused on educator wellness. We welcome Dr. Tina Bogren, who is on fire for educator wellness. She is someone who's a fierce advocate for educator wellness. She has spent time uh, with curriculum and other parts of education, but uh, she has grown and developed into someone who first and foremost wants to make sure that all of our educators are healthy and thriving. And the thing I appreciate about her, I mean, she's written some awesome books on curriculum as well as educator wellness. Um, But her advice that she gives in her books, on a podcast that she has in her, uh, apparently in her professional development, I haven't seen it, but you know, after talking to her, you get the idea, are just nuggets of wisdom that are so practical and easy to try and it's just so real. It's, you know, for instance, if you're, I just imagine going to her or going to her resources and saying, you know, I am burned out and you being able or her being able to point me to five different places to try. And one thing that may work for her may not work for me. And so her encouragement would be for that advice would be, let's throw that out, try something new. Here's another idea. And I just, it's so practical. Uh, you'll feel it from the, the time we say hi to each other, her heart to um, support educators, uh, to help them, uh, again, to, to thrive is just, it's, it's there. And it's someone that's, she's exciting to talk to. I, I guess you can tell that I really enjoyed it. Her background is really cool. She has some background in Solutions Tree and Marzano. And so she gets education. She gets the the end product of helping serve kids and get them uh, to be lifelong leaders. But her passion, as well as my passion, but her passion, which comes across so clear in all that she's doing and all that she says is she wants to see educators thrive and she wants them to see them be well. And she wants to equip folks to be well, not just in the job, but also how do you take care of your physical self? Uh, one of my favorite sayings she says is drink your damn water. And so I'm going to leave it at that. Drink your damn water. Uh, it's rare that I say something like that. So I'll let you wait and find out what she means there. But um, yeah, it's, this is one of my favorite conversations. So I think you will all enjoy it. I uh, appreciate you listening. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Uh, it's the start of the school year. So if you know an educator that is in your life and hears this podcast, share it with them. Uh, Tina is someone that people need, more people need to get to know. Sorry, Dr. Bogren. Uh, uh, you understand why I get really comfortable with her quickly, but uh, she's just someone that puts you at ease and someone that uh, really, really cares and loves people. So it's an awesome conversation. Again, thank you for your support. Thank you for being a loyal listener and enjoy this conversation. It's one of my favorites. As we talked before, um, one of my passions since, be, you know, since I was a teacher and then became a district administrator is the well-being of our staff, right? The well-being of the teachers and the frontline folks who are in the fight every day. Before I even get to our first question, I got to start here just because your heart is just um, so on fire for this. Where did this passion and discipline focus for educator wellness begin for you? Yeah. Oh, it's such a good question. And I love the, my heart is on fire with this is such a perfect description. <laughs> yes, I think so. My, I was a teacher for a long time, instructional coach, administrator. And when I started the work I that I do currently, I started with Marzano Resources. That was fantastic. I, I worked under Dr. Robert Marzano and learned all about instruction, which is incredible and still a huge portion of the work that I do. I got to go out and work in schools. And um, what I saw was tired teachers. And this was, I'm old, it's pre-COVID. This is just the job is tiring anyway. And and it was like, we just white knuckled our way through instruction. If we can just give them instructional strategies so their classroom runs smoothly, we will be okay. And something just wasn't, it just, we were missing a piece of it. And looking back now, I can kind of trace all the, all the kind of like little steps along the way. At the time, I wasn't even aware of it. So I had that passion. I also, I was traveling for work and uh, not taking care of myself. So I was run down and burned out in my own job as well. And as, as the universe often does, while I was hitting this, like my own personal burnout, I was 
also co-authoring the book, Motivating and Inspiring Students. And the irony was so great. (laughs) And (laughs) what we did in that book is we used Maslow's hierarchy to talk about strategies for students to meet their physiological needs, their safety needs, all the way up the ladder. And it was this aha moment of my first reaction was, oh, I can't ask teachers to do even more. This feels like even more. And then it was the light bulb moment of, oh, wait, I can't ask teachers to do this. I'm not even doing this for myself. And so I just personally went on this this mission to kind of these strategies we were reading about to try them for myself. And it, it just slowly chipped away. I kind of got myself out of that kind of dark hole that I was in. And then people started noticing a difference. And I was like, well, what are you doing? What's going on? What's happening? Like, you seem different. And I was like, here's some things I'm trying. And I mostly am around educators. So they jumped on board and it just kind of organically came about. Now, the the other piece is when I worked on my dissertation, I studied highly reflective and effective teachers. Like I did a phenomenology. So I say I was, I was just studying these magical unicorn educators that like are super effective and highly reflective to try to see like, how, how are they that way? And unbeknownst to me at the time, now it seems so obvious, but one of the things that I found in doing that study, just a small dissertation though, was the most effective teachers are, they are effective at the sacrifice of something else in their lives. So every single one of them had health issues. There were just personal things going on and we were burning them right out. So it was like all these pieces came together and the 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 mantra what i always share is we know the most direct correlation to student achievement is the teacher in the classroom which is why we focus so heavily on instructional strategies and giving people like strategies that have an effect size that say they have a good chance but the aha moment was oh wait it's the teacher and that teacher is a human being and so the aha moment of oh wait wait i don't care how good the strategy is you know Dr. Marzano, John Hattie can hand it to us on a silver platter if the person providing that strategy is totally burned out, worn out, exhausted, compassion fatigue, that strategy is not going to have the impact. And as schools move towards the incredible, important work of social emotional learning for students, all the research says, and, and we know in our core, is that that work starts with the adults. And so my argument is we jump straight to the students and forgot the adults. And then that's all pre-COVID. Then COVID hits and it's like even more so, it just got, it just escalated into this place of now my, my, my heart is on fire of, I have a firm belief that if we take exquisite care of the adults, then they will in turn be able to take exquisite care of students. I'm not worried about them taking care of students. That's why they got into this job. They do that so well. What I'm concerned about is who's taking care of the adults. Yeah. I mean, it's like the Southwest model. So some folks have heard this, me say this before, like when I went to college in Dallas, Texas, um, SMU, shout out. I don't ever give them a shout out, but shout out. Uh, <laughs> And one of the one of the case studies I did, uh, my best friend and I uh, studied um, uh, Southwest Airlines, right? You know, they have the heart in yes. the middle of their symbol, and they one of the, the the tenets they always talked about is it's not the customers always right, it's our folks. We focus on our people, and if we treat them well, we will model that, and they will treat our customers. They will make the right decision for our customers. Now, for those of you who I've worked in Southwest and they don't operate that every day. I can't say that, but like the ideal is what we're always fighting for. And it sounds like that's what you're trying to fight for within education. I, right? Yes. I've never heard that. I love that. Actually, like I had a full body reaction to that. I just got goosebumps <laughs> of because yes, doesn't that make so much sense? And if you, yeah. if you feel good, you show up at work differently. You interact with people differently, no matter what field. So I love that. Yeah. So you know, my, I, I told you earlier, I had an epiphany when I was in school turnaround mode of like, if, if you were one of my teachers, you know, I'd be like, God, it's about the students, do whatever it takes for the students and yes. look past you. Yes. And it was my aha of seeing that was breaking people. And, you know, what, what do you think it's going to take, or maybe it's already happened for educators and school district leaders and state education leaders and principals across the country to recognize that teacher wellness is probably the first and foremost thing they need to consider before all the other strategies. Yeah. I would say two things on that. I, I, it's even 
even more than teacher wellness, educator wellness, because I'm seeing administrators are actually crumbling faster than teachers yep. and paraprofessionals and school psychologists. And, and I think it's, it's good news. It's one of those, like, it's hard to find the silver linings of COVID, but if we're, if we dig hard enough, I think this is one of the silver linings and I have tangible <laughs> data to show. So pre COVID I've been doing this work for a long time and I would get, when I do workshops with schools, you know, administrators would say, focus on the instruction. Yeah. 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 If you have time kind of get into that, that self-care stuff, but like, <laughs> eh, maybe not. Right. Or maybe, maybe over lunch, you could have a little conversation. And it was always like, no, no, we're all about student achievement. There's no time for that. And there was a missed connection, no matter what I said. And now it's totally shifted. And the majority of my work is centered around the wellness piece. I think it was this aha moment of exactly what we've just said of, if we don't take care of the adults in the building, it all falls apart. So I think we're getting there. I think that that, and I, and it's not going to go away. I think that we, this, this notion that of course we still think about students. Right. And it, because for a long time, I think it was an either, or it was like, we're either thinking about student achievement or we're thinking about the wellness of the adults. Yes. And I think finally we're seeing, no, no, one can't happen without the other. So it's not wellness or self-care at the expense of students. It's not like, oh, I'm not going to do lesson planning for self because of self-care, right? It's not, yeah. those expectations don't change. It's, it's knowing that we actually are able to engage with those instructional strategies differently when we, when we just flat out feel better. So I think, I think we're getting there. The, the, there's a shift that's happening. It feels different. We, we, the folks that I work with, when we talk about this, it, 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 it hits so much differently post COVID, especially as we're losing teachers and we're not attracting new teachers to the profession. Like when something major happens, you know, this is our chance to change. And if we go back to what we were doing before where it's, it's no, we can't do that. This is like the opportunity very rarely. And hopefully never again, do we have something disrupt us so massively. So if we miss this opportunity, I would say, ah, oh, we've, we've just, we've missed the boat there. And, and I do, I, the, the good news is I think that we are, we're seeing this shift. So, uh, I got, I became a teacher in the early two thousands and admittedly I came, I, I grew up in Florida, went to college in Texas. So I was exposed like when I was learning to be an educator to a lot of like no child left behind yep. type policies. Right. And yep. I, my heart was for urban education. And so for yep. me uh, and my wife, it was always about, we didn't want a kid's zip code to define their future yes. opportunities. Right. And so yes. that's why we were so focused on the pedagogy of learning and the discipline of getting results. And I feel like I missed the precursor to that. And I've asked all my veteran friends to teach me that. And I, I'm curious for you, I think what happened was we were on this side of the pendulum over here, maybe like you said, too much just teacher, just lesson plan focus, not results focused. And so instead of stopping in the middle, we do what we always do. We switch to the yeah. extreme opposite and then eventually figure out how to get back here. Where, where were we, do you think, prior to the intense focus on academic achievement and sole focus on academic achievement, I guess. Yeah. And I'm just a couple years ahead of you and, it, <laughs> but understanding of the, and I am definitely ahead of you, but the, the history. So I even take it back further. So I think about the standards movement. So that was before me, but just, just having learned so much about it through, through right. the Marzano work of it's again, a perfect example of that pendulum swing. So before that, there was a real, and this is, again, huge generalization, but a real emphasis on student relationships, right? Like the, the, that strong, strong relationships. And then it was the aha moment of, oh, strong relationships don't necessarily lead to learning. Like kids still need to learn, right? It's not just liking the teacher and the teacher liking the students that learning has to happen. So I think that pendulum swung so far to like, we don't have time for the relationship piece. We have got to focus on instruction and that you know, no child left behind and massive standards move it nationally and at states and emphasis on the, the state level, national level assessments. And we swung that way. And so pre COVID, I said it was nice because we were kind of getting back to the middle of yes, relationships obviously are part of that. And so I think the same thing's happening here of 
pre-COVID, it was, again, as I just said, like, no, 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 instruction. We cannot think it's all about students, all about students, which of course it is. I'm not taking away from that, but that we, you know, do take care of yourself on your own time. That's what summer is for. That's what like later on. And now we can't swing. Like I said, we can't swing so far of like in the name of teacher wellness, we're not doing our work well, right? It's not like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lessen my responsibilities at work. It's the balance of finding both of those. So that pendulum swing is real. And those of us that have been in this for a while, we just watch it come back and we call it something different. This to me, in my history and experience, I don't think that we've focused on teacher wellness before. I feel like this is this is a new addition, which is yeah. exciting. Like we need to, and the next generation is going to force us to. They're not going to work the way that we <laughs> do and did. Yeah. Well, one of the things that you said earlier was uh, I, I talk to people often about uh, the best teachers. It's funny. You have the research that says it. It's just a gut for me traveling all across yeah. the U.S. and Canada the last 10 years. But I always find the best teachers are the best martyrs at some aspect of their life. Right. Yes. Like you said earlier, like the, they have a health problem. They may have a relational problem. They may not be present as often as they want to. And to me, that breaks my heart because yes. those best people like want to be good at all the areas and maybe yes. just dove too heavy into this. What kind of supports does either your book provide or other learnings that you have provide to help people? If they identify with this, they heard you say, yeah, I'm a martyr. I got to figure this out. How do you help people break that cycle? Because those are the yes. folks we got to keep in the game most longest. Exactly. Yes. Could not agree more because we know those, those highly effective and reflective teachers, right, that are so good, we can't lose them because they are the ones that are absolutely huge gains for student achievement. So I, it can feel, especially those those teachers that have devoted so much to to the the their professional lives, which oh my gosh, kudos to them. So a couple of things. Number one, what I would say from a leadership perspective, is we need to differentiate for our teachers, right? Oftentimes we do things, it's just like a model in the classroom. We do things for our entire staff and, and we frustrate our really effective teachers because they're like, you gotta be kidding me. I'm doing the same thing as this teacher that's not performing or this brand new baby teacher that needs different things. So that differentiation I think is, is first. Like what, if you have an expert, it's like, what do you need? How can I support you? Rather than I'm gonna make you do X, Y, or Z. And then that idea of what I really try to provide is, is a structure and super simple strategies of they're all research-based. It's not, I always say, it's not just Tina Bogren thinks it's a good idea because it's usually not a good idea. It's all seeped in research. And, and, and I've dove, like my, my, the nerdiness in me loves to research. So I look at all different fields, like there's not much around education, but like looking positive psychology and health and wellness and the nutrition, like all of it to see what are those strategies that we can do that, that for me, what's most essential, don't take a lot of time, don't cost any money. I don't want it to feel like an addition to the to-do list that just makes us feel more guilty. Um, again, a generalization, but oftentimes I see this with women so often, mothers, educators that, that put themselves at the bottom of that to-do list. And it feels like you can't ask me to do one more thing where, where if we think of the term self-care oftentimes just feels like, ah, this like extra addition, something else that I'm not good at. Or we do things like jeans day on Friday and say, we're, we're promoting self-care. I'm all for jeans day on Friday, but that's not, we have some systemic things to get at. So what I, I started in the realm of self-care of like looking at specific, these, these strategies, I use Maslow's hierarchy. And then when COVID hit, Tim Canold and I came together with this like passion around, we've got to do something. So that's, we like head down because we were quarantined at home anyway, and like dug through the research to create a wellness framework. I'm so deeply familiar with, with R, the Marzano instructional framework. And so it was the same idea of if we have an actual framework to really these four big dimensions of wellness to give us a starting place. It's the beauty of an instructional framework. If we have a wellness framework, we have a common language. We have a way to talk about it. We have a way to support each other, which helps move from the idea of, I'm st still working on articulating this well, moving from self-care to collective care. I also think we can't continue to just do this in isolation, one teacher at a time. When we think about 
there are some pieces that individuals need to tackle, but ideally, if we think of that whole idea of collective care, moving from self to collective care, where we're all supporting each other, it's it's similar to the idea of a high-functioning PLC. If you've got a professional learning community that, that they're now all, it's not my students and your students, it's our students working together. What if we put that same lens around thinking about wellness and supporting each other that way? So I, I love, you know, uh, this isn't to demean the work in any way, because I'm just as passionate about self-care as you are. Like, it's something that we always talk about. But just thinking about the community coming together and creating yeah. an environment for that yes. is next level. What are those components that you have seen in certain districts or schools that you visited that are like, man, you guys are really taking care of each other well? Yeah. I'm. I, I'll be super honest. I'm just now starting to see it. I wish I could be like, oh, I've got this perfect totally. example, right? Exactly. We're working on it. We are getting yeah. there. Um, what I have seen are little snippets. So staff will, and this is the, so my book, 180 Days of Self-Care for Busy Educators, what I do is I outlined for an entire school year, week by week. So week one, I give one tiny little thing to think about. So specifically week one is all about music. And I give it just a snippet of research of why music is important. And I give an invitation for each day of the week, a tiny little thing to do. And then at the end of the week, I say, check in, did it work for you? Keep doing it. If it didn't let it go, because that's the other thing we're not so good at, but I've set it up so that you can do it individually or you can do it with other people. So I've seen it's staff, like take take this and say, here's our goal for the week, music, playing it with different ways, like doing different things, sharing playlists, having dance parties, using music in their classroom, playing music on their way to school, rather than listening to the news, like those small things. And then reflecting, do you feel better? If so, keep doing that. If not, who cares? It's fine. Let different it strategies work for different people. Let it go. But so I've seen a staff take that on and just play with those tiny little pieces, which has been huge. And, yeah. and the interesting part of that too, is that book's been out long enough that I've worked with groups that have done it for a few years. And so they start over at the start of the new school year and strategies that didn't work for them last year will work this year. I always say we move through different seasons of our lives and so true. people with small children at home are in a very different season than empty nesters. So honoring all of that, I think is, is essential. And then now, so the book that just came out is the educator wellness book, as I said, with that framework, and we're, yep. we're starting, we're working with schools and districts to introduce the framework. And in the book, we have all sorts of like tools to take them or leave them like in a self audit, setting yep. goals around it, doing check-ins where are, I hope that you interview me in a year or two years and I say, oh yeah, we've got all these schools that not only do teachers set professional goals for student achievement, but they set personal wellness goals, professional mm -hmm. wellness goals that, that they're working towards and that someone's checking in and supporting them. And like, if you, if you've got the four dimensions and you start to break it down, if you have a, a group that wants to say they do their self audit and there's a group that says physical wellness is what I want to work on pulling that, that group together and, and allowing time to work on those pieces. So I hope that that's the direction that, that we go in, that it becomes well, as relevant of a conversation as it is with student achievement. Cause we have to have both. We can't, can't let go of the student achievement part. So the educator in me that's drawn to you one, as we talked about earlier, is that fire you have for teacher wellness first and foremost, or uh, educator wellness first and foremost. Right. Mm -hmm. Second, is you said something that I've, I've, you know, I've, I can gather, uh, through just learning about you online of bite size, something, yeah. you know, quick, quick tidbits that like don't cost anything to just yes. take those baby steps. Right. Yes. So I'm curious, I'm just fascinated with how you do this. So I'm curious with, uh, the four dimensions, how does that, as well as your assessment tool, if I'm coming into this, what are you setting me up for? What am I trying to figure out? Walk me through that a little bit. Yeah. So the, the framework that we have is we, and I'm giggling because the, the, we have the same reaction and I had the same reaction, Tim and I writing it had the same reaction. So we do the self audit and what happens, I mean, you have to do that carefully because most of us do the self audit and all of a sudden we're like, Oh no, I have so much to work on. Right. <laughs> like, 
ah, oh. so we always say, no, 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 no. So it's the like halt right there. It's just an awareness piece. And of course there are pieces of celebration. And we spend a lot of time actually celebrating because most of us just kind of blow over those and like, don't think much about it. It's like, no, no, let's celebrate those. And, and what is the, how do you feel like those are actually helping you feel better and relate with students in different ways and then say, okay, look at the areas that you feel like you have an opportunity for growth and let's narrow in. We, Tim and I both reference all the time, James Clear, his incredible book, Atomic Habits, 1% better. That's our mantra of like, because otherwise you get too overwhelmed, like baby steps. What are those teeny tiny little things that we can do to just start to feel better? I think once we remove the, there, there can be a feeling of, of shame, quite honestly. And it's like, woof, no. So we really spend a lot of time, like getting rid of that and recognizing why, why some of those areas are in need of improvement. I mean, think what we've been through the last few years, like just incredible. And then again, those teeny tiny bite-sized pieces. So it's like, what, what one area do you want to work on to really focus? And what does 1% better look like? That's awesome. Uh, and you know, with the, what I appreciate are good visuals, right? So you yes. have the wheel, I think that yes. the, shows it right. The social, physical, mental, emotional, and then remind me again, those, those 12 areas, I think it's 12, right? Yep, uh, yep, yeah, yep. 12, 12 areas. What do those make up? Like for physical, you got food, movement, sleep. It's just the yeah. simple things that you can do yes. that are low yes. hanging fruit to get better. Yes. Okay. So we, we like in a, in a, the full framework, exactly. As you said, we've got that wheel showing that they're all, it's this cyclical thing, you know, that our definition is, is when we think about our own wellness, it's a continual, we never, that's the daunting part. We never get to a place where like, and done, right. It's a yep. continual work in progress, lifelong, we would say. So in those four areas, and, and the idea is that I, when those are balanced, then the wheel can turn and no one ever has those balanced at all time, but it's a recognition of like, oh, what is off? And then we identified what we would call routines. So three routines for each of those four dimensions. Mm. And again, just all built out of the research. So when we think about our physical wellness, this, this actually is a lot of the physiological needs at level one of Maslow's hierarchy. And so we see that just our physical wellness is about food and movement and sleep. And we were really purposeful in choosing the, the language there. Uh, it's not diet. It's not going on a diet. It's not anything extreme in that area. It's not about shaming people. It's about the most basic form of self-care. And what I would say for educators, we're talking eating lunch, like just starting there, like going to Using the, the bathroom, bathroom right? <laughs> Drink stupid water, which is my mantra, right? And then movement, not as not thinking of exercise as a form of punishment for something we ate, but like what it feels like to move our bodies in whatever way and then sleep and rest. Oh my gosh. I mean, that's the one that I always say for me when sleep, when I'm not getting enough sleep, that the entire wheel just turns can, into a flat tire. Can I ask you about that? Cause my wife yeah. and I have like different sleep patterns. I mean, she works yeah. crazy, crazy hours as chief of staff for her district, but I've always told her, like, I've gone through phases. I, I told you I've got these weird health conditions. And so I've gone yes. through phases where I have tried to sleep and be disciplined about eight or nine hours a night. Yeah. And I have this whoop band that like tracks yes. my sleep a little bit better. Yes. I've, got the, I've got the aura ring. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> for me, it was, uh, I felt before I had any of the bands, before I was really sick, that my body, as long as I had a clear mission every day, a clear schedule that are clear, like, morning routine and bedtime routine, I probably only needed six hours. Like, and I yes. felt great. And I did a, my own study for about a month and a half where I would go to bed around 10 ish, wake up at four ish. And I was recovered. I was green. I was good to go. Is there yes. anything in studies like that? Because sometimes yes. I feel like the sleep studies are, I got to sleep eight hours. And I'm like, well, yes. I tried that. It didn't help me. Yes. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad that you asked us. Cause this is, this is the exact thing that we talk about of like, that's the whole experiment of figuring it out for yourself. Yeah. So it's kind of like quite, okay. So my mantra, I'm going to come back to sleep. I promise my <laughs> mantra is drink the stupid water. Right. And there's, there's studies out there that say we're actually, we're doing okay. As long as you are hydrating the, the, what I would say about drinking the stupid water is just, I say, try it and see if it makes a difference. And the story I give is 
I wasn't drinking water. And I had, when I shifted to drinking water, I was like, oh, what a low hanging fruit. And I don't have headaches anymore. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> so knowing yourself, and that's why I say this, like, whether it's a week at a time, a couple weeks at a time, experimenting and sleep in particular is super fascinating to me because yes, the general in a general population, they, they say recommended is about seven to eight hours. What I know for myself is I need eight to nine hours. My mm -hmm. husband, I don't know, needs hardly any, he's the same thing. And I worry about him and he's like, but I feel fine. I'm not impacted. So I know for me, I am impacted the experiment that I always say, and, and this is, it, it, it's hard to do, maybe in the summer, but like when you get to a place where you are truly putting yourself to bed, if you can just wake up without an alarm, your body will start to tell you. And if you wake up feeling refreshed and ideally, if you get to a place where you just wake up without an alarm, you know, you've kind of hit the sweet spot. Mm. The, the area of sleep that I've been talking about is I always say, but yes, you, but you have to like put yourself to bed. Have you heard this term of revenge bedtime procrastination? Uh, no, but I'm all in. What is yes. this? So there was an article that came out on NPR and I don't remember where the original study was, but they coined the <clears> term <throat> revenge bedtime procrastination, which is for, and it's usually, it's people that are really stressed and really busy at night. They know they should go to bed, but they scroll and scroll and scroll. And it's this like getting your power back of like, when you don't feel like you have control of your time, it's like, I know I should go to bed, but I'm going to spend three hours on Instagram. And then the next morning, what was I doing? Right. But right. so that, that experimenting, I think is huge. And then knowing yourself, and that's the key. The hard part of all of this work is that different strategies work for different people. I think most of us have gone through life and our best friend goes to CrossFit and it changes her life. And we think that's what I'm going to do. And then we hate it and feel bad about ourselves. So it's figuring out what, what works for us. So what I love about what you shared is the experimentation part of figuring out. And then, and then the nice part is once, you know, just shut down all the noise. You don't have to read all that stuff anymore. It's like, Nope, I know what works for me. I've got my nighttime routine. I know what I need. And if I can stick to that, I'm good to go. So that's an area like, let it go. But that's the problem with like the wellness space in general, like whether yes. to your point of CrossFit, like my, uh, I, I was a college athlete. My uh, uh, best friend in college was certainly not. And he got into CrossFit post-college and loves it. And it's yes. done. I mean, he looks amazing, has all the energy to be a, to his wife and kids. It's great. I've tried it. I feel so bulky and like uncomfortable yes. that it just does it for me. It doesn't. And to your point, I'm like, I had to get through that guilt of like, yes. well, I can't do this with you, Thomas. I got to go here. Yes. Uh, and so it's really freeing to hear you talk about whether it's your, your 180 days uh, uh, of wellness, right? Or was, as I said, 180 yep. days of wellness, yep. right? You got it. Yep. Of self-care. Yep. Self-care. So you try something every day and you, if you don't like it, you let it go. That in the wellness space, I, there's so much guilt out there. Cause they're like, well, it looks, it works on TikTok, It works on Instagram. Yes. It's not working for me. And what makes me sad is that we've turned this into consumer self-care, right? In fact, mm. I use the term self-care for years. And that's why one of the main reasons that I've started shifting to wellness be, is because people have a bad taste in their mouth around self-care because it is, we feel guilty about it. We think it. It, it is bubble baths and wine tasting. And listen, I'm here for that, but that is not actually what helps us feel better. So yeah. it's, it's a different definition of self-care. And I think, I mean, it, like everything, you follow it back to the money, there's money to be made because this is becoming one of those buzzwords. And so it's like, if you buy this, it, I'll give you the easy way. Here's the shortcut. Just do this. And there are no shortcuts. And that shutting the noise out, I think, is one of the hardest parts of it. So have, huge. Have you seen, sorry, I'm going macro on us again. Oh, yeah. Uh, ha, as you're talking, I'm just trying to think of like yeah. you know, my wife's school district or other yes. school districts I've worked in. Like, have you seen any good assessments out there or any models that you've seen from researchers that have tried to think, if I'm a superintendent, how do I know if my staff is in a good place wellness? Yes, that's exactly what we tried to do in the educator wellness book. Yep. So that's why we've got the the kind of the assessment in the back of like, and, and you can do it anonymously, right? You don't want people to have to share with their boss where they are. And we always like, 
So Tim and I will do a trainings. We will like blow up the assessment and you can use like just anonymous sticky dots. And it's also a really powerful visual. When you look at your entire staff of like, whoa, clearly we need to focus in on physical wellness or wow, that emotional, whatever it is. And kind of to be able to get to that big picture piece of it, because that's exactly, in fact, that the next book that we'll be working on is, is how you take that dimension from that leadership perspective. You can, you can use the book as the leader now, but we really want to get into like specifics. How do you, how do you like step-by-step, what are some things to do? Cause I think that that, and again, they're too busy to try to figure it out on their own. What we're trying to do is just make it as easy as possible. Like here, try this. (laughs) So what, you and you and Tim obviously have done a lot of research. And earlier when I gave you an example of like, well, I started in education this time. What I meant was I've not done a ton of research, what sure. the education system looks like prior to then. And so yeah. I'm sure you guys have done research in the past and vision setting for the future. What what is your vision? Like when we we get to a place where districts and state agencies possibly are really taking this seriously. What does that look like to you? And you didn't have to be as clear as uh, maybe like, here are the assessments, here's the priorities, but I'm just curious what you guys have thought around. Yeah, I think the biggest thing, and I kind of mentioned it earlier, the biggest thing is we envision schools and districts that, that just like teachers write those student achievement goals every single year, they also write a professional wellness goal. And that time is spent and resources are spent helping teachers to reach that goal. Um, we love that so many schools and districts have wellness teams now, which is so fantastic. And as I work with those teams, so they don't really know what to do and they do great things like coffee carts and, um, you know, little treats, which I'm all for, but if you take that team and the hope is that, that through the work that we've done of providing support around. So within each of the routines, then we give some sample strategies here's some strategies to try that goes to a little bit deeper level that those teams can really focus and work on that. And that the cool part is all the strategies that work for the adults work for the students. So it goes back (laughs) to your Southwest example. If a teacher knows that they feel really good um, drinking water, I'll go back to the water thing, right? They're much more apt to like nonchalantly and or blatantly tell students to drink water. I have had groups that like they play <laughs> drink your stupid out. water. Kid. Drink your stupid water. Maybe they use a different language, right? But yes, <laughs> but like so but then there's no harm in that and that modeling of of the taking care of the whole self. So, you know, we've talked about taking care of the whole child. It's the same idea of taking care of the whole adult and those strategies just work across the board. So that, that vision is really exciting that we see. And I think we've left a lot of space for not getting too tight in that for future vision, because we love when we just provide foundation and then watch schools take it. That's like the, the hope is eventually we get to a place where we write a book of all these just different examples of schools and districts that have taken this on and what it looks like for them. Cause quite honestly, it does, it looks different in a, in a rural environment than it does in an urban suburban, big, small, like taking those pieces. Cause Tim and I both do. So I met the high reliability schools summit and Institute through the Marzano side. And I do the PLC summit and Tim's part of all of that. And we, both of us have um, breakout sessions on wellness and they are standing room only <laughs> people cannot get in they're laying on the floor they are willing so so the need is there and as we what we do at those all those events is connect it back to the hrs framework the plc side of things so again it's not just this extra credit add-on it's like no when you do this in the hrs model the high reliability schools framework this is level one a safe orderly environment, collaborative environment, where you have people working together to support the, so that the adults are at that place. We always say like a a high functioning PLC is one of the greatest forms of wellness. Here's my own personal vision. I envision a place where you go to school and you have your PLC team and you have like a standing meeting in the morning and you do like a wellness check-in. So I could say to you, oh my gosh, Justin, I did not get any sleep last night. 
you know, my, I had a sick kid at home. I am really struggling. And Dustin says to me, you know what? I got you today. Like, let me do this for you. Or why don't you send that particular student to start the day with me? You catch your breath, whatever. Knowing that later on in the week, when you're having a rough time, I am going to pick that slack up for you. It's like, when we shift from my students and your students to our students, then we also think about how we care about each other. I heard Brene Brown talk about in her family, they do this like check-in, especially it was during COVID. They do a check-in. They decided that as a family, there were four of them, the four of them needed to equal 100%. And so they shout out percentages. So if like one of them was like, God, I'm only at a 10 today. And someone else was like, you know what? I'm feeling pretty good. I got 75 today. So like <laughs> that idea of as a team, you have to equal 100%. And knowing, and there's a lot of trust, and this goes to the social dimension of, of the framework, but wow. And to me, what that's going to do is it's also going to help with our current retention crisis. Like research shows that if you have a friend at work, not just someone that you are, that you get along with, but an actual friend, you're more likely to stay. And so can you imagine, and it, again, that's your collective care. Instead of holding all of this on my own, I know I have a team of people and like, you've got my back, knowing that I've got your back later on, like that trust and coming together. I just think that that can revolutionize what's happening for all of us. And what a gift for students. Oh, I totally agree. I think uh, you said something. I think it was Marcus Buckingham, the Gallup organization, I believe, like back in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, sometime was talking about one of their indicators for like a great culture was, do you have a best friend at work? Yes. Uh, and it's fascinating to hear you come back up with that. Cause I do think yeah. that's key, right? Like I'm, if I'm connected to my best friend at work, things are going, yes. if I'm not, things are kind of rocky a little bit. Even if I, yeah. I don't recognize why it's yeah. important to have. Yeah. And if you're, if you look forward to going to work and especially as educators, right? We spend all day talking to kids <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. having that, like, I just, I think back, I worked at a middle school forever and I worked on these incredible teams with people that I loved. And like when we were having a good time and joking around, like I showed up differently when I walked into my classroom, that, that matters like without a uh, doubt. And gosh, we are losing teachers so fast. So anything we can do for that retention. Yeah, I, I couldn't uh, agree more. So if folks are listening to you, which I am. So uh, you're about to get a, a big following here in St. Louis, you. just in my personal world, uh, you know, and wherever hopefully this podcast goes, if folks are listening. They're like, I got to learn more about what this is about. Is the best place for them to start uh, Educators for Wellness book or is it somewhere else? Or, uh, yeah. Some other book or some so other there, there's like lots of little, there's lots of entry points. Right. The, the major thing that we're pushing right now, we are doing, we are so excited. We have two inaugural events. We are actually doing wellness institutes, two and a half days of a deep dive into this where, where educators can come on their own or as a team and they will walk away with a plan, whether that's for themselves or their school or their district. So we've got one at the end of September in Plano and one at the end of November in Colorado. So that is where we're telling everyone like, ah, we are so excited. And it's, it's four of us. It's Tim and myself and Regina Owens and Jasmine Clark. It's like dream team. I don't even want to present. I just want to go to their sessions. We've been meeting and talking about their each session. So the sessions are all about the routines. And then at the end, we and you will do the assessment. You will create the plan. So that's the, the big thing. In terms of reading, yes, that the educator wellness book is where, where I would send folks for that that kind of overview of the whole framework and then filling in that my self-care work, which would be the 180 days book and the take time for you, where we see that that then gets into those specific strategies. So the educator wellness book doesn't have a ton of strategies. It has some samples. So it's kind of the overarching picture. And if you really take that dive and you're like, oh, okay, now I need some more strategies then those two books really help to kind of fill it in. I've also got a coaching for educator wellness book that would be for instructional leaders, which is talking about how you support physical support, institutional support, and physical as in like getting your classroom ready, instructional support, and that wellness piece, how you combine that. And then the, the beginning teacher's field guidebook for new teachers themselves 
I also put specific self-care strategies for new teachers to think about. So those I would say are all kind of strategy books that the overarching framework piece would be the educator wellness book. And then I've got the, I have, I have two, two things that I'm really proud of. Number one is the Facebook group, which is this organic, I call it my badass self-care squad. I started it years ago. It started out with like 20 people. I remember I like ran downstairs and I said to my husband, there's 125 members. I don't know 125 people. They can't all be my friends. And we now have over 15,000 members of that group. It is the most positive. It is my happy place. And I always say, I know Facebook isn't for everyone. It's for old people. I'm an old person. It's where it started, (laughs) but oh my gosh, we have people that are super active. Some that just kind of just, if, if you need a boost in your day, I always say, go there and read the comments. So I put every single morning, I just post like what's something good about today. And the comments just come in with pictures. I post some videos there. So that organic group makes me so happy. And then the other place is the podcast. So the podcast came out during quarantine. And it's so funny to me because in my mind, I just sit in my little office and no one listens to that, but apparently people do. And the (laughs) the podcast is set up to be, it's once a week. It comes out, it used to come out on Mondays, but a listener suggested Sundays to remove the Sunday scaries. So we drop it on Sundays. And the commitment is that the podcast is under 10 minutes. It's not an interview format. It is just me talking saying, here's one thing to think about this week. So it goes back to that. Just try this one tiny little thing. It's there's two seasons of it. I'm on a a break right now during my busy season, but I will start again for Labor Day as the new school year really gets going. Yeah, I like that you have it around a Labor Day clock. And to your point, it's refreshing. I, I, I don't want people to not listen to our long form interviews, but it's refreshing no, to have so something great. you can go to yes. for like six to eight minutes. That's what I said earlier. You say under 10, but I feel like everything's pretty disciplined yes. to six to eight minutes there. Yes. Yeah, it's awesome. Absolutely. Well, Thank you. Yeah, of course. Before we let you go, we've got uh, rapid fire questions. The first one okay. is what habit or discipline do you instill in yourself every day or every week that helps you be the best version of you? Mm. Sleep is number one. Mm. I have to, I, I am at a, a stage in my life where, where sleep is it's hard. And as you know, as someone that travels, um, but I know for a fact, if my sleep gets off, everything else falls apart. So I am like a sleep zealot. So sleep <laughs> and it's, for me, it's physical wellness. It's the sleep. It's the drinking the stupid water, moving my body and really, um, paying attention to what I eat in a way that makes me feel good. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I know you, we talked earlier, you probably won't love this question, but what's <laughs> either your favorite book you've come across recently or one that you've read in your career that you think other people really need to check out? Okay. This truly, and I know this is rapid fire and here's me not being rapid. So I am a voracious reader. I mean, so, people can't see the background. I know. Got, and I can't even count the books you got there. <laughs> and the whole house is filled with books. So my question is always like fiction or nonfiction, which was, so in terms of a professional book, the one that I keep putting in people's hands. And I mentioned it earlier is atomic habit. So that is a life changing book to me. I have read it multiple times. I hear it's also fantastic on audible, but that to me is the one of like, just start here. So that's a recent one within the last few years that I, it's the one, I mean, I have bought more copies of that book and put it in more people's hands than probably any other as of late. So that one, that's the one that comes to mind first. That's great. So uh, you talk about the importance of music. We believe in the importance of music here. Uh, what's on your playlist, whether it's you're working out or walking around the neighborhood or read or, you know, uh, work, you know, uh, driving through town, wherever it is. So I'm giggling because if anyone knows me, they know that I take my playlist very seriously. And in fact, I have two playlists on Spotify that people have just been drawn towards. So if you look me up on Spotify, Tina Bogren, there's, there's two. Now you get my whole, I don't even understand. I think you get my, all of my playlists. And so please understand that what I listen to, to work out is not anything anyone needs to listen to around children. Like I am a child of nineties rap, like the halftime show, was my was the best. Oh God. I don't even get me started. <laughs> so yes. Um, but so, cause music is so important to me. In fact, that like going back to your first question, I, I almost forget this one. Cause it's so obvious. Like 
I start every day with music. My morning routine to get myself like what I always say, game day ready is music. I used to watch the news. I thought that's what adults did. And that's a terrible idea. So it's all music all the time. Um, so I have a good mood playlist, which is my playlist. And that's what I use at workshops. And then what's super fun via the podcast, the very first episode, I talked about music and I asked people to add their favorite songs to this list I created on Spotify. So you can search it. It's called educator 911. Cause we call it our emergency list. There's over 12 or 13 hours of music there. I always say that one comes with like a warning I don't curate that. That is for the adults. Like I listen to that when I'm out on my walks and every once in a while I'm like, oh, thank God I'm not in front of seventh graders right now. But that's super fun. So music to me is everything, everything. I love to hear that because our, our family is very much into that. We don't necessarily have any musical talent, but we love it. Oh God, no, um, no, I can't sing. I can't dance. Yeah. I can't do any of it. I just really like it. Yeah. <laughs> we, we try to do all of it, but none of us really have any talent. Oh, really? uh, if my husband so, were here, he would be like, oh God, please don't ask her to dance. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so last question. I mean, you're around people that are just thoughtful and inspiring to be around. Um, you're probably exposed to some really cool people through your own Facebook group community. What's the most inspiring piece of advice you've come across recently that you just have to share with others, whether it's about change, whether it's about self-care, whatever it is that you just like having the, you know, you can't get it off your mind. It could be this morning, right? Just something that you have to share with people. Okay. You might push me to get, to give you something else, but he, but my honest to God truth is I'm so glad that you told me that about Southwest. I did not know that. <laughs> like, that's such a great example. Um, because I get in my world of just thinking about educators and quite honestly, nurses, uh, nurses as caregivers, two most stressful, yep. you know, and I have a lot of nurses that are part of the Facebook group and nurses, friends that are nurses. Um, and so I, I sometimes get in this little bubble here, but it's nice to think about this on the larger scale as well, especially as someone that travels a lot for work. So that's on my mind. And then I guess for me, it's, it's, I, I, Brene Brown, I am a, a follower of Brene Brown as, as many of us are. And her definition of integrity, that idea of practicing your values, not just professing them mm -hmm. is something that I work on all the time. Cause I always say this wellness work, I am not standing on a mountaintop because I figured it out. I am absolutely walking beside us. Like everything Everything that I recommend, I have to try myself. I have to try it over and over. Every day, I have to tell myself to drink this stupid water. It is hard. So I know that when I talk about wellness and give these ideas and suggestions, I have to walk my talk. So one of my core values is integrity. So I encourage all of us, especially what I would say is leaders listening to this, because again, it's not just setting up wellness for your teachers. It's modeling it yourself. So if you feel like wellness is important for your staff, model it, right? That's starting there. It's practicing our values, not just professing them. That's awesome. Well, this has been a jam-packed uh, 45, 50 minutes. It has been awesome. I Thank you for making forever. time for us. Thank you. Oh, this was such a blessing. This is this is absolutely my favorite topic in all things education, just so we're clear. So I just love that you're on the front lines of this and however awesome. we can help as an organization, however I personally can help, uh, let's stay in touch because I think, Please, uh, let's like do. you said, this wave needs uh, warriors. And I'm glad to see you and Tim on the front lines of this. Awesome. Could not agree more. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate you. Have a blessed day. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Please support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel, uh, podcast on Apple or Spotify, and help us celebrate the beautiful, messy work of shaping human potential. Mm -hmm.